Just for context, um, I used to maintain BusyBox and ToyBox and am working to redo a lot of user spaces for publicity. Um, Jeff founded uh, Jeff founded UC Linux and is now doing open hardware. And uh, Kawasaki-san was the architect of the Super H platform. So all of us are sort of doing our thing combined in this project. Okay, so thanks for having us in today. Um, uh, I think we'll uh, kind of start off with what is this talk about? Um, uh, a few years ago, um, I decided to start a company that uh, was going to do energy monitoring systems. Not uh, the kind of thing like uh, uh, smart meters, but uh, devices that uh, go in substations and uh, measure power on the electricity grid. And uh, these are uh, devices that don't look anything like car navigation systems or cell phones or that kind of thing. And it quickly became apparent that we needed some custom uh, chipset in order to do this. And so uh, we were going to become a, uh, a fabulous semiconductor company, regardless of whether we wanted to or not. And it wasn't the intention. You know, uh, I founded UC Linux in 1996. We did uh, the first sets of embedded uh, operating systems that were based on Linux. Um, and uh, things like UC Libc and that followed from that. And, and BusyBox, of course, was uh, taken from the original UC Linux um, distribution. And then eventually we get to ToyBox, which is kind of the, the new thing. But what does it actually mean to build open hardware? Um, open chip designs are something that people have done. Maybe you've seen uh, opencores.org and things like that. I think this is a little bit different for one important reason. Um, first of all, uh, we didn't intend to do this as a hobby project. Um, it started out as, uh, as something really quite serious. And uh, at the same time, it was always intended to be open, but it was intended to be used for uh, the next generation of devices that you might be able to buy. So um, there was something very different about that. Um, so uh, why did we choose the uh, Super H to, to start with? We did uh, a search across all the different architectures that you could find. And we took a look and we said, well, what about ARM? Because everybody does that. And the instruction density was very low. And the kinds of devices that we are trying to build are uh, very deeply embedded, very, very small devices. At the time, there wasn't a thing called the Internet of Things. Uh, and now Internet of Things is a, is a thing. It's a name. And this is what this is for. And the Super H instruction density is very high. At the same time, it has DSP functionality. And for things that are connected to the internet, you need signal processing. And so that was important. We also looked for our open software platform that we worked on before. And we did an awful lot of work on, on, on that sort of thing on Super H. And so we decided, well, it can't be that hard to make, uh, to make CPU cores and all of that and put a community together. We were quite successful with the UC Linux community uh, in the, early 90, or the late 90s or early 2000s. And so now uh, we decided to kind of carry that forward with a new site that will be released soon called noammu.org uh, for very deeply embedded platforms and sensors and things like that. And the uh, Open Processor Foundation, which Kazakhstan founded in uh, California, it's a nonprofit. Um, we need to clarify that the website is 0pf.org yeah. because opf.org so, was taken. That's a zero. <laughs> so zero. This, this talk is about uh, how you go from silicon all the way to software for an IoT platform. Uh, uh, not, not a simple one, not something that measures temperature or something like that, but something that does um, very difficult signal processing on power system waveforms. And In we can in real time, and we can show you that uh, in bit. So I'm going to hand this over to Kawasaki-san to talk about the uh, the hardware stuff. Oh. 
2013年の,あのモバイルコングレスあのワールドモバイルコングレスのやつですねなんかベンチャーキャプターで今回のやつですあの<笑>自分のとこではなんかあのアームプロセッサーをライセンスしてるんだけどなんかその A15 っていうのを使わなきゃいけないプロジェクトが5つあってでそれぞれのなんか会社に、ね、おのおの20億ずつ払うから全,全部で100億ぐらい今年は払うとかっていう話になってるんだっていう話があって昔10年ぐらい前に話をしてたなんかそのチップのライセンス会社っていう話をもう一回やらないかとかっていう話があってでまあそれが元でですねあのちょっとあのスタンフォードがであのやってるホットチップスっていう学会に行ってですねあのそのあそのク,レスタクレスタベンベンチャーファンドっていう会社と一緒に行ってあのまあ、アップルの人とかインテルの人とかオラクルの人とかあのスタンフォードの人とかバークレーの人とか話をしてで、まあ、言われたのは、まあ、まずとりあえずノンプロフィットを絶対作る,作るべきだと、まあ、いう、まあ、話をされて作ったのが、まあ、このオープンコアファンデーションオープンプロセッサーファンデーションですねっていうノンプロフィットなんですけど<笑>、まあ、あの概念はですね OPF はあの基本的にあのいわゆるあのど,どういう格好がするかっていうとその FPGA とか ASIC のバリデーションベッドだとかっていうのをあのサーティファイするみたいな要するにソフトウェアから見た時に同じ機能がそれぞれ提供できるということをまずあのガ,ンガンモンのこういうものを使ってですね、えーとまあ、そ,れそれ以外にはそのもう一つの枠,枠としてですね Linux とか、まあ、あの UC Linux とか Android とかこういうコードをあのきちんとこう、まあ、このそのクロスツールとそのランタイムと両方あのきちんと作るというあの話があってで、まあ、ここでそのしかもそのただ単純にそのなんていうかカーネルっていうよりは全部のあのコネクティビティのスタートだとかそれからまずファイルシステムの,あの,あのとかですねあのそういった必要な、まあ、あのコンポーネントとかもある程度きちんと。積み上げたかここで、あの、今サポートするということ、あの、願目にやってます。で、えっ、ー、とですね、あの、一応、あの、どういう感じで始めたかというと、最初に、まあ、この自衛っていう名前だったんですね。実は、あの、トレードマークとかっていう問題があって、我々 SH っていうのを使えないんで、自衛っていうのと SH っていうのをひっくり返すと、あの、あのイクイバレントな制御、そのなんかインストラクションセット。ISA になるような格好のあの格好格好にしてますでそれで J32 ビットリスクっていうのが、まあ、あってでこれはのジェネリックな IoT デバイスを中心に対してやっていてそれ以外に J2 プラス J2 のですね32ビットリスクの SMP っていうのを今作ってます SMP ってあのシンメトリックマルチプロセッシングも,もちろん皆さんもこの辺だと思うんですけどそれプラス S コアっていう名前の DSPRA をあのクラスターにしてでそれをあのです、ね、あの公開するというのを次にやろうとしていてで、まあ、対象はその信号処理の IoT だとかそれからあの、まあ、まずそのここに出てる次世代の,あの電力の送電送,送配電の技術のチップとそれからメディカルとインフラストラクチャー用のセンサー、そういうものに対して使えるようにしようとしています。それからあと、まあ、もう一つ今来てる話はですね、の J4 のリスクの SMP で、プラスシングリアレイというので、それをまあオートモーティブに対して、あのドライバーアシストペイドライバーアシストに対してちょっとあの作ってみないかみたいな話がちょっと来ていて、これを、これ、まあ、こんなで、今中心にやってるのはこれですね。ここのこの世代のやつをやっています。それで、えー、と一応ですねそのその、先ほど言ってましたが、SMP っていうのを実は有識になるので、これから実現しようと言いまして、まあ、そ,のそれが今、今週、来週、再来週ぐらいのところで最も重要な課題なんですけど、あのそれ以外にさらにもっと言いますとですね、ここに、まあ、スコア DSP っていうのがありまして、これはあのあの独自の DSP なんですけど、これももちろんオープンソースとして
、しかもさらにそれのクロスツール、あのまあ、あのアセンブラーだとか、さらにその CPU からどうやってそ,のそこに XYT メモリーにダウンロードするかというコールを、まあ、一通りあり作ろうということを考えています。で、まあ、あのどんなイメージかといいますと、まずあのそのリスクの SMP っていうのを最初にリリースして、その後、そのリスクに SMP と DSPR、まあ、まず16個の構成、でなんかってあのその数をパラメタライズできるような、そのなんていうか、相手をちょっとや,やろうという話と、それから、まあ、こっちにあるあのシンディアレイ、つまりあのリスク SMP プラス N ディメンショナルシンディアレイというのイコール、世の中で GPU、GPU と言っているのとかなり似た構成なんですけど、ただちょっとこれは、あの、実時間用のなんていうか味付けをして作ろうという話でございます。で、それで、OK! So, it's,、uh, it's uh, thank you for that. It's, it's kind of interesting、uh, when you start to look at what does it mean to, to build this kind of a, of a system.、Um, you have to go all the way from, from、uh, simulation all the way through to ASIC process. And、uh, in order to do that,、uh, you need tools. And if it's an open platform, you want to make sure that you can do everything open up to a certain point. And so、uh, all of the RTL, which,、uh, as you saw on the previous slide, will be open source, but we use the GHDL simulator in order to get there. And that thing is essentially a VHDL front end for GCC. So you can generate、uh, native code that runs on your Linux box or your Mac. And you can simulate the chip.、Uh, it's kind of slow, but it doesn't matter.、Uh, it gets you where you need to go, and you can prove the whole thing. And、uh, we use a dialect of VHDL that's a little bit different than everybody else.、Uh, it uses a bunch of syntactic sugar,、uh, which means it's very easy to write these kinds of、uh, function blocks. So you're leveraging the C preprocessor, which they'll be. You're、right, the C preprocessor is leveraged, and there's actually new keywords that we added to make VHDL very much object oriented. So you can have、uh, encapsulation inside your hardware, and you can instantiate instruction decoders and things like that very easily. And then、uh, once you have your simulation working, you can go with Xilinx ISE. It doesn't cost anything, it's not open source, but the, the,、uh, the barrier to entry is zero.、Um, and I think h o s a k s a n has.、Uh, yeah. Has a board here that you can buy、um, from, uh, uh, where's this one? a v n e t Yeah, Avnet. Right. And they call it microboard.、Uh, this is called a microboard, yeah, that's right. And、uh, this board has、uh, FPGA and DDR memory and Ethernet and everything that you need to run Linux except an SD card.、Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's what? Less than Jumanin. So you can mine it. Each time. Yeah, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's different. Yeah, yeah, so it's cheap.、Hmm. Um, and then from there, uh, uh, once you have the low cost board and it's doing the things that you want to do, you can go the ASIC flow. So uh, uh, we estimate the die area for the chip that we are in tape out for right now for the CPU is about、uh, 0.4 millimeters square.、Uh, so it's very, very small. And that's.、Uh, A、uh, very low cost process. And、uh, here's the tool flow. So,、uh, in this particular case, the、uh, uh, SH、uh, compact instruction set is、uh, in an open office format. So, it's just a spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet generates、uh, processor documentation and also the RTL code for that, for the, for the processor generator. Um, and another open office spreadsheet、uh, contains the、uh, instantiation headers for whatever peripherals you want. So, you know, I want five UARTs and three Ethernet ports and DDR memory and all of that. You just put it in the spreadsheet, run the SOC generator, and out comes both the FPGA, the simulation, the ASIC flow output that you need in order to make a chip, as well as header files that can go into your. Uh, the tool chain, if you're doing bootloader or programmable、uh, operating system,、uh, or a Linux device tree specification into the software flow. So,、uh, there are some interesting things with,、uh, with this. Another question is、uh, how, do you, 
how do you build something like this without having a problem? Um, ARM, of course, everybody who's tried this before knows they go after people who make an open CPU, and they try to stop you. Uh, the SH2 patents expired in 2014, so we are okay. And uh, we intend to do the J4 in 2016, so look for that. And we also did a clean room implementation uh, in Canada with engineers from there uh, for the initial RTL of the uh, components that may overlap with the original Hitachi. Uh, and some of the original engineers uh, from that project uh, validated the results. Uh, there's no trade secrets in here. All of the uh, stuff for this kind of a platform is open. It, you need it in order to write open operating systems like Linux. So from the specification, you can do this. Uh, and we're not the first, uh, as Kostaksan mentioned, the RISC-V guys are trying. Uh, they don't have a purpose yet. They know they want to make a platform, but they don't know what for, uh, which I think is one of the differentiators. that We, we know why we're doing this. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the only thing that remains is uh, is just some trademarks. So, can, can I actually uh, sure one comment on the fact that this chip is being made for a purpose? Uh, the chip development is funded by the creation of a product, but that's the work we've done so far, and we're doing more work for future products. We have found a lot of bugs and fixed a lot of things because we are running real-world code through this and testing our app on it. And each time we have to go, is it our app or is it the hardware? We've found bugs in both and fixed them. Hmm. So we've, you know, one of the problems you have with uh, open designs that are just made for some academic project or something is that if nobody's used them, you don't know if it actually holds any weight. So uh, what does, um, uh, why bother with a new chip? Um, you're probably still asking that question. Um, so a normal SOC may look something like this here with this kind of uh, stuff. So you have, we have an SMP CPU arrangement. Uh, we have a DDR memory interface. That's fairly standard. Um, the rest of this is not. Uh, we have 16 DSPs in this particular uh, chip in an array, and a uh, ring bus controller that shuttles data around the chip very quickly. Uh, it's designed to connect outside uh, to analog sensor interfaces running at very, very high speed. This interface is about 1.25 megabit, uh, gigabits per second. So it's uh, incredibly fast. It turns out that uh, measuring power system signals is a hard problem. And we had to build an analog front end chip in order to do that properly. And so uh, we'll show you that chip in a minute. And you need hardware accelerators in addition to the DSPs in order to do this kind of measurement. Um, you can get most of the way there without it. But if you want to do all the things that are in the current standards for like IEEE or IEC uh, power system measurements, you actually need hardware. Um, so this is this block shaded in here is the reason why you would adopt this platform for anything. Because your application may be totally different, and you can't find a chip today that does the thing that you need. And so this custom logic gives you the ability, the, the ability to add this custom logic just on the ring bus or wherever you need to add it, lets you make something really special. So that's, that's the, the real purpose. This is the energy accelerators here for that. And of course, we have other things that, that, that you need as well for energy management, like a GPS receiver is actually on chip. We had, to, we had to build a GPS receiver. So this is the type of application that we're talking about. Um, I won't go too far into this, but um, uh, just, for the, just so you understand why we bothered to do this. Um, analog front end connected to high voltage power system. Uh, digital inputs and outputs, that's not too hard. Time synchronization for GPS at the nanosecond level, that's really hard. Uh, you can do it for microseconds or 100 nanoseconds, but you know, five nanoseconds is very, very hard. Um, so how to do that? And the DSPs, uh, the only people who have DSPs like this are TI. Uh, so this is an IoT play. So going all the way from measurement, computation, communications, and control in a chipset, uh, is, is what the purpose is. So, 
Um, what does the software stack on something like this look like? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we're putting together a standard Linux environment. It's slightly non-standard in that SH2 is a no MMU environment. Um, well, J2 is a no MMU environment uh, instruction set compatible with SH2. J4 will eventually be instruction set compatible with SH4, but we have to wait for the patents to expire and it takes some time to implement that. So right now, one of the advantages of using an existing processor, uh, using an existing instruction set, is that there is support in GCC, there is support in bin utils. Um, it may have bit rotted a little and you know had to be debugged a bit, but it didn't have to be freshly implemented. Although for LLVM, uh, going forward, there's there's more development work to be done there, but we could come up to speed with existing tools uh, and GDB. Um, one of the things about doing a no MMU system is that no MMU systems can't run stock ELF binaries. Mm -hmm. They need a different output format, and the ELF to flat tool. Uh, there was, there was a bit of a problem that we'll, we'll get into later on some things we've had to clean up. Um, due to the fact that the UC Linux project was very important for 10 years, but those 10 years started in 1996 and ended in about 2006, when they pushed all of their code upstream into the vanilla Linux kernel, into the tool chain, as UC LibC was maintained by other people, and the main UC Linux project pretty much rolled to a stop. And now, due to things like Cortex-M uh, there's there, and, and our project, there's, new, there's renewed interest in it, but the previous community scattered. The, the previous community was not maintained. So that's, we're going to talk about the new, th the new, uh, condensation nuclei we're putting together, the new community focus and documentation of things. There are existing engineers, for example, who learned this stuff in the 90s, but there's not a whole lot of people who've learned it in the past five years because it became increasingly difficult. Um, on the kernel side, we have some CPU-specific patches. Uh, I've forward ported, we've done most of our development on 3.4, but I recently forward ported them to 3.18. Uh, probably around 4.1 or 4.2, we'll try to uh, submit the basic board support patches upstream. The, the, the patches to actually add board support for a new platform, uh, you need the memory layout, you need to set up the interrupt controller so that the scheduler actually can connect to a timer. You need at least a serial console to do your initial development. It's nice to have an Ethernet card. It's nice to have an SD card driver, although if you have some sort of bootloader that can load you into memory, you can just run out of an init RAMFS for your, for your early development. Putting together a, but we want our kernel to be as close to vanilla as possible. We don't want to maintain this stuff out of tree. That's just painful. We would like to be able to move to each new kernel as it's released and do our regression tests and be able to use all the new stuff like OverlayFS and those sort of things. Uh, on the user space side, we're using UC LibC right now because it has existing SH2 support from back when you know, SH2 was in production. So J2 runs with that instruction set. We would like to move to muscle libc going forward, but we have to add support to that because muscle hasn't previously done no MMU stuff and the maintainer thinks it will mostly work, but it just hasn't been tested. And muscle supports SH4, but not SH2, which has different system call semantics because it uses a different register selection. So there's just some, some little tuning things we have to do to add this architecture variant to that platform. That's still a to-do item. Uh, we, we came up to speed with a UC Linux distribution, but I've gotten uh, over 90% of the toy box commands running on it, and so we're moving our user space to that, and the one that we're going to be uploading to the web uh, for everybody to use should be uh, mostly toy box based. We're weaning ourselves off of the old UC Linux commands. 
And we're using init ramfs as our, we're actually using init tempfs as our default root file system. That's just init ramfs uh, using tempfs instead of ramfs as the backing store. That's a, that's a patch I pushed upstream a couple of years ago. The advantage of that is ordinarily people don't like using init ramfs as their persistent file system while the system is running after the system comes up because it has no size limitations. If you allow it to be writable, if you write enough data to the file system, the kernel will lock hard because it runs out of memory. Well, tempfs actually has a file system size built in that's enforced. By default, it's 50% of the memory. So it will fill up and give you disk full errors rather than bringing down the kernel. And that also means that if you try to if you try to run pack things like uh, the RPS the RPM command queries the available size RAMFS will always return zero. TempFS will, will return an actual number calculated by how much space it thinks it has left. So a lot of packages that don't work in an init RAMFS context should work just fine in an in an TempFS. And init TempFS. If you've enabled TempFS on a current kernel and don't specify a root equals parameter, you should just get it. It should just work. The root equals parameter signals that we mean to switch off to a different root file system, so we're not staying on init RAMFS, so don't have the extra overhead of that file system type rather than RAMFS that's real cheap to overmount and ignore. Um, I, guess the next slide. I think it just says demo one. Um, oh, well, yeah. All right. So. Um, uh, I thought at this point we should we should do a little bit of a demo. Um, I've got a board running here. Uh, this is not a development board. This is a customer board. Um, and this device is uh, is uh, an evalu evaluation platform for our uh, analog front end and SOC. This is an SOC module that runs this uh, uh, J2 core. Um, and the system on chip is an FPGA here, but uh, it's basically a full system on chip that does the things that the customers want. And uh, so we'll kind of start slow, and then we'll 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 get bigger. So I'm gonna if I can find where the cursor went. Uh, I'll just tell that into this board. Linux system running on uh, running on FPGA uh, on top of J2. Um, we can do cat proc uh, CPU info if I can type without seeing what I'm typing. Uh, maybe I need to actually go there and have a look and see what's there. This is uh, this is the uh, the, the chip uh, SH2 um, uh, Elf with uh, with Big End in, and uh, uh, if we look at the PS, uh, this is the application. It's uh, this is sort of IoT as I mentioned, and so the main application running here is called Caliper. It's the measurement application that uh, implements um, uh, measuring uh, things like uh, things like voltage and current and phase angles and synchrophasers and all kinds of things. So let's just go to the board again. And there we go. So this is the embedded web server that runs inside Caliper. And uh, uh, this is our analog front end chip here, um, uh, which uh, uh, if you could buy some, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to start. Um, some signals going into this board using Audacity uh, because uh, we need some power system signals and of course we're not connected to the grid here. Um, oops, I think I'm on the wrong output. 
No, no, that's right. Yeah. So uh, let's just uh, have a look at the uh, at the RMS. And so I've got I've got a current and a voltage on channel one and the channel two. And so I haven't set up what the units are, but uh, you can see that the measurement is really quite accurate. Um, that's not too interesting, but this might be. So let's capture um, a record from channel one and have a look at the spectrum. So here's the kinds of things that you can do with, uh, with onboard DSPs. Um, uh, you can see here that this is uh, 60 cycle power system waveform and the harmonics are way down around uh, uh, 100 and 105 dB. Uh, this is a pretty good sound card in these Apple Macs. Uh, so this is uh, really quite interesting. And there's some noise here. And you can see that the spectrum goes all the way out to, uh, to, um, to very high frequencies. Uh, um, the analog front end captures all the way up to one megahertz. Uh, and the noise floor is very low. So this kind of thing is, uh, is uh, again, not for meters, uh, not, for, not for home use. Um, and of course, the waveform that you capture looks like a sine wave. And again, I have to put this down. Yeah. So kind of kind of interesting. Um, so that's what that's what we do, and that's the use case for for this uh, for this chipset, um, and what you can do with a uh, with a with a chip using this kind of thing. So. どんなことやってるかって話をしてもしよろしいはい、ピンクちゃんあの、どうですねまずあの、この開発の中でというのがすごく面白くてあの、実はあの、まずあの、先ほど言ってましたそのPGAっていうのが、こういった感じの技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技術の技
Yeah, we haven't released yet. Uh, yeah, but uh, also that the GHDL itself is. Yeah, GHDL is open source, but you need a few other little things in order to do the FPGA. Side. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the simulation side is open. Uh, there are some custom tools that we have that are not yet open. Mm -hmm. uh, so GHDL itself is, but the RTL dialect we use, we still have to open source the tools. Right, right. Yeah. So I mean, that, uh, so gradual, uh, that's what um, to clarify some of the reasons it's taking us a while to uh, release this stuff, we're not just dumping a tarball up on a website and going to have that. We have to write documentation so people who aren't us can learn how to do this stuff. Right. And we're trying to give uh, source control repositories that go back in our development process. So it's not just a tarball that, that springs fully formed from the head of Zeus, but you, you can actually go back and bisect and you know, get annotate and see where things came from. And that means that we have to go through the, the source and make sure that we didn't leak anything that you know is proprietary code or is something that was licensed and then removed. We have to make sure that what we release can be under a BSD license. So we're, we're doing that work now. Um, up until recently, we were focusing on making it work. Now it works pretty well, and we're doing the cleanup to send it out into the world. So you kind of so at ELC, uh, Jeff was coincidentally in town to talk to some investors, and I sort of grabbed him and dragged him to the Monday night dinner to introduce him to people like David Anders, who you know you should really meet. And we were talking about the state of the UC Linux project, which he co-founded, but he wandered away from as he's been doing other things. You know, he, he was involved in it for 10 years, and those 10 years ended 2006 or so. And the problem is that uclinux.org was originally a distribution that is now composed entirely of obsolete tools because it was the site that collected all the NoMMU variants until they went upstream into the vanilla projects. And when they went upstream into the vanilla projects, people lost interest in it. And if you go to uclinux.org, you'll find you know, a lot of the references you know, are from 2003, and they link to site pages that have gone 404. His, his co-founder is still nominally maintaining the, the distribution in that Every year, he takes the previous tarball snapshot, updates what packages are still maintained, and puts out a new snapshot. But you'll only find that if you go back in the, in the news page. It's not listed in the nav bar on the left. If you go to the downloads from there, the newest file date is 2003. Um, and UC, uclinux.org wasn't just a distribution. It was also the site that served as the focal point for the Linux no MMU community. The mailing list was where you went to ask, okay, I want to learn about no MMU. What do I need to know to program applications here? Or to put together a new no MMU BSP for a new board. You know, what does user space need? What does the kernel need? What are the programming considerations? And there, there's been a vacuum for a few years now, which has been interpreted as a lack of interest in no MMU. Meanwhile, the Cortex-M came out, and everybody in the world is trying to do Cortex-M. That's an ARM variant that implements the Thumb 2 instruction set, but removed the stock ARM instructions. And it's a no MMU chip that people are very, very interested in. But they keep look, they keep asking around. Well, where do I learn about Linux no MMU? They get pointed at the UC Linux website, and then they go, "Oh, this is stale. Obviously, nobody is doing it. My interest must have been a weird oddball thing." And they they bounce off and they go away again. Well, we're fixing that. Uh, and the way we're fixing it is we're starting a new website because no MMU isn't. I'm sorry, UC Linux isn't quite dead enough that we you know, want to just shove what's there under the rug. Because 
a couple people are apparently still using the old distribution. One of them gave a presentation at ELC, one of the, the two microcontroller things, he based it on UC Linux. But we want a site that is just information about how to program. I am interested in knowing you, what do I do? We would like to provide information about the common Noam and you platforms that are out there, not just the one we're doing, but also, you know, what is Cortex-M, uh, ARMv7-J is a Noam and you stock ARMv7 instruction set variant, uh, RJ2 processor, uh, Coldfire is still around, and Coldfire is interesting because KiwiMU supports it well, so if you want an emulated Noam and you platform, Coldfire is, is interesting in that regard. And uh, Blackfin is still around. And these are some examples of GNOME and U, uh, things that should be properly documented. In terms of application development, when you're writing for a GNOME and U system, you can't quite write code as you would normally on other systems because since it, can't, since it doesn't have a memory management unit, it can't expand the stack. Which means you have to tell it at compile time how big your stack should be. And that usually means you're selecting a size of like 64K or something like that, rather than I want a 2 meg stack, because every instance of your program will then eat 2 megs at launch that you probably won't use. You can't use fork, you have to use a, a different system called, called vfork, which pauses the parent program until the child either calls exit or calls exec. And as soon as the child has, and until then, the parent and the child are sharing the heap. So it, it's sort of like you spawn a thread and then the thread becomes a new process instead of having two independent copies of the same heap. Because it's not just that we don't have copy on write, which would make spawning a new heap expensive, especially if you're about to exec again, but it's actually impossible to share the heap because you have fixed addresses. Every process sees the same addresses as every other process. So if I spawn a new process and I copy the heap contents over there, the pointers in the new heap will point into the old heap. So some NOAA and U chips have like a high watermark and a low watermark register where you can, you can filter what this program can say, see so your user space program can't stomp kernel memory. But it's not going to be translating the addresses. So at best, you'll get a seg fault trying to use the new copy of the heap. At worst, you'll be messing with another program's heap. So that, that's why you can't use fork. You, you need to use vfork. And I, I wrote up some documentation on that for the BusyBox fact years ago. The stuff about fixed, fixed stack size is buried on a, an obscure page on uclinux.org. Um, the ELF, the, the reason you can't use ELF and have to use either the bin flat or FD pick format is off on other pages that uclinux.org tries to link to them, but the ones it links to is 404 because they've moved somewhere else. And since almost nothing is linking to the new pages, Google actually has a certain amount of trouble finding it. You just have to know where they are now. So we're putting together a website that collects together all of this information in a place that it will be maintained. Um, also, if you want to just try out Cortex-M or try out RMV7J or try out J2, try out Coldfire, try out Blackfin, where do you get a tool chain? Where do you get a test environment? and what emulators or example boards are available. We need to collect documentation and, and links to those. Uh, in terms of system development, we don't want to maintain our own distribution. uclinux.org was a distro, and that's kind of what dragged it down, because distros will eat an unlimited amount of, of time, because dealing with package upgrades is a never-ending treadmill. We would prefer instead to point people at packages like BuildRoot or Open Embedded and go, here's how you configure them to get a no MMU system. Well, right now, neither of them actually support new no MMU particularly well. I spoke to the maintainer of BuildRoot and the maintainer of Open Embedded at ELC uh, a couple of weeks back, 
and both of them are interested in knowing of you, but they didn't know where to learn this stuff, and they didn't have existing test environments. So we're talking to those guys to push support upstream into those. And then we can link to theirs and provide configuration information instead of maintaining the distro. Uh, education, the, the learning all this stuff, a you know not just a reference, but a tutorial. So you are interested in no MMU, where do I start? What do I do? Walk me through the process. We need to write this information. And it's not just tutorials for no MMU.org. We'll, we'll get to the second site in a moment. Um, and then in terms of upstream staging, if people do have patches for things like we have <coughs> set of patches for our, our J2 thing, this, this board that we're doing right here, uh, it, it comes to like eight patches that need to go upstream. <coughs> we can act as a staging area. <coughs> we can collect bug reports. We can, we can fix things and we can push them upstream into kernel, into LLVM, into muscle libc, that kind of stuff. And I mentioned build, read, and open embedded. We need to push stuff upstream into there. So I think one question is why would I bother with no MMU in the first place? And, and there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, one is because you want the cheapest possible platform. Somebody, I think it was, uh, I think it was Tim said he wanted a 10 cent processor. Uh, so over lunch we just calculated how much the processor costs in silicon, and it's 2.58 cents. So that's pretty good. Um, uh, so there's his, uh, there's his less than 10 cent processor. Of course, the packaging is going to cost more than that, but um, uh, it's a start. And there's another reason too, which is more important for this project, um, uh, or sorry, this this product here, the the uh, the sensor product. Uh, it's latency. Uh, doing those translations and those lookups uh, takes an unbounded amount of time in order to replace out the uh, translation look aside buffer entries. So if you're trying to do something that has mission critical real time performance. Uh, uh, you really want to do that with either lockdown TLB entries or you want to do it with no TLB entries at all. And uh, when we work with the Samsung guys uh, on the ARM port, uh, they're now the ARM maintainers actually for, for, some, for some parts of things, uh, they found out that in order to get the kinds of performance they wanted, I think it was for video, that uh, they ran uh, ARM 9 with no MMU. And they found that the system performance was really quite interesting. And so they sort of made a hybrid where you can turn off a translation for some types of processes in order to get real-time performance that's really, really interesting. So in this particular case, since, since we've been doing GNOME and you for a long time, we just didn't bother with it. Um, and as a result, the processes are deterministic. So uh, you, can, you can guarantee the customer, uh, especially in a power system, where you want uh, the relay to trip off in a very specific amount of time, we can guarantee that that actually does happen. So, zero PF. Oh,、okay. Uh, If you do this one in English, I can tell what you covered and what you have. All right. Okay. So, so what happens is like that. Uh, uh, what I uh, like, we we have, we're gonna just release the VHDL, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we're gonna just actually uh, like the, make that the JIT repository with full history and then and the and the BSD license, mm -hmm. and that was like um, your big idea, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, we don't just want to give you a tarball. We want to actually make it so that if you do a git annotate to see why we did stuff, you can get commit history. You can see the development of our processor. We want people to be engaged in the process so that, you know, as it comes time to do the SH4 port, somebody may beat us to it. You know, that would be awesome. Save us time. So and uh, uh, like we're gonna just actually like that the release of the J2 processor and an S1 DSP and then like pretty much that the full SOC with peripherals and make files rather than just actually giving you like the pieces and bits and pieces but we just actually try to give you that the whole like that the LTL in that the more fairly coherent way so that you, you know like people can actually just actually put together an SOC themselves and. Uh, 
then uh, you know, like uh, we we gonna, we're gonna have, of course, like we're gonna get uh, like a bit streams. That is the bit streams to the FPG. Okay, yes. go ahead. Please. If you haven't done FPGA programming before, I had to come up to speed on this stuff. And one of the reasons I'm very interested in writing documentation for this is I still don't know how to do a lot of it. VHDL is the source code. The you know it, it's text that tools mangle in order to produce bit streams. VHDL is compiled into a bit stream. A bit stream is the binary that you load into the FPGA to actually instantiate a processor. You have to set up a VHDL toolchain. The toolchain we're using is a Xilinx product that is a free binary only download from Xilinx. So you've got to go to their website and sign up with the thing and then download it. Um, that's not ideal, but we're clearly not writing our own, uh, our own compiler for this. But we do have to document not just how to use it, but how to set it up. What are the installation steps to configure it? Because that's a little non-trivial to write a how-to. And if you don't want to do that, if you just want to go, okay, I'll mail away from one of these little red boards and plug it in, and I want to actually get a shell prompt using your binaries first thing before I actually try to fiddle with anything. Well, we need to post the, we need to post the binaries upstream. We need to post the bit streams and we need to post a VM Linux image. Our VM Linux image has uh, an init RAMFS in it. So with those two binaries, you can theoretically just boot to a shell prompt on a serial port and start playing. One of the things about the bit streams is the, the cheap red board that we've been waving around, stock that comes with an L9 uh, Xilinx FPGA. And the problem with an L9 is it's got a lot of FPGA gates, but it's their lowest end offering. You can fit, our, our, early, de our early development was done on an L9. You can fit the base processor on it you can fit the serial port on it. And I'm told that if you're really, really lucky, you can just about exactly fit support for the Ethernet on it, and then there's no space left. This is using, this does not have dcache or iCache. This is instead using a prefetch unit. And part of the configuration thing is when you, you, you can switch the prefetch thing off and then switch iCache and dcache on, which do their own stuff. But there's not enough space in here to have dcache and iCache and Ethernet, because you just run out of gates on the FPGA. The next FPGA up is the LX25, but you're not going to find one of those boards for under $100, under 1,000 yen. Um, those boards should have space for adding the iCache, the dcache, and Ethernet, and still have some gates free. But when we're talking about our designs that add 16 DSPs on a ring bus, you don't have the gates for that on that. That requires going up to the next one, LX45, and then you're up in the $400 to $500 range. So we want to offer a series of options here because if you're a hobbyist who isn't sure they want to get into FPGA programming, or if you are a developer at a company who is trying to avoid having to deal with purchasing authority and you want to put together a prototype to then use as justification for funding, you have the chicken and egg problem of, well, I need to order three of these. That's, you know, 15,000 yen or something like that. I, if I, had, if I had the thing to demonstrate after, you know, two weeks worth of work, then I could get the purchasing authority, but I can't do so before I have the purchasing authority. So we want to let you be able to prototype on, an, on the low end one and then move up as you feel the need or as you, as you grow beyond the, the cheap plastic ones. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of documentation. I'm a software guy dealing with all these hardware guys. If you are getting into open hardware because you think that this sort of thing is cool, you need a lot of instruction. And 0pf.org, one of the things we want to do is provide 
either the instruction or pointers to where you get the instruction. Because there, there is a lot to learn. It's its own programming language. It's its own type of programming. But you can do it in an open ma manner now. We now have a working processor design that can be expanded by anyone. And it's a Git repository. We accept pull requests. Or will when it's up. All right. All right. Anything else? Okay. Uh, uh, I have one question. But, uh, so why you 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 choose to create the app? Because of, uh, in Japan market, yeah. there's uh, so many many hardware vendor using to very well Right. So um, uh, their log and DHDL are very different languages. Uh, if you're just getting started and you want something, uh, you, you've written C for many, many years, the Verilog looks very attractive. So management thinks that Verilog is a really good language. But when you start to look at it, uh, Verilog is actually a very limited language. And it doesn't have data types, for instance. You can't have uh, structures. You can't have data hiding. Now, in, in, um, in system Verilog, a lot of those problems have gone away. Uh, but system Verilog is not supported by a lot of open source tools. So if you want to write things at a high level, you don't have much choice. Mm -hmm. So VHDL is a robust language. It's designed around a uh, ADA. It almost looks exactly like ADA. And you can do records, structures. Uh, you can do the kind of data hiding that we're used to in the programming world. And it's, it's written by people that understand how to do uh, languages properly, computer science type people. Uh, Verilog was designed by tools guys that wanted something really fast and cheap. And so the difficulty is uh, Verilog is really hard to maintain as a result of that. So if you start to write a processor in Verilog, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code, and there's just many, many ports, and it's not clear where everything connects. And in the dialog, uh, in the in the um, in the dialect that we use of VHDL, the connection between, uh, for instance, the processor and the dcache is just one connection, and that connection contains all of the control signals. So there's an in and an out, and you just hook it up. And if you were doing that in Verilog, it would be maybe 50 connections, and you have to get them all right. So that, that's really the difference, is for, from the point of view of a sort of literate programming, programming where, where the code is self-documenting, it's easy to understand, it's approachable. You want the iCache to fit on one page of code. You want to be able to look at it very, very clearly and understand what the inputs and the outputs are. And with VHDL, we can do that. With Verilog, we can. So that's the reason. OK, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for the presentation. So I'm a bit confused. Okay, I have surprised to see that all of you use a visual sky, EU CX guy, and the SCT guy working together. What's a group for combining you together? Uh, um, SE Linux, oh, sorry, SE Instruments.com. Yeah, Smart Energy Instruments. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, uh, instruments. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Okay, you're working as a team, right now. That's right. We're He's team. my boss. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so we we are a fabulous semiconductor company. We make uh, we make chipsets for energy markets. Uh, and so, um, I'm my company is funding all of this effort. So we have uh, SH Consulting mm -hmm. uh, helping with the hardware, and uh, we have a team of hardware and software engineers in Canada and US. And uh, we have an office here in Japan that does uh, all of the chip development, uh, which is where I am. So, and so I have a question regarding the rope. So I was very bad man to decide the discontinuation of the SA2 investment in the, maybe five, six years ago. Mm. So you have particular problem because you know you mentioned that you try to catch up with all the latest upstream migration. Does that mean that you try to revive the SA2 code in the mainline tool chain, the mainline Linux, or you could that? Yes, that's right. I got into BusyBox development because of a project that's now called Aboriginal Linux. It used to be called Firmware Linux, but you couldn't Google for that. Mm -hmm. My goal was to take Linux from scratch mm -hmm. and simplify it as much as possible. When I started, Nopix was very interesting. And 
since the Linux from scratch base system was 110 megabytes, mm -hmm. I was thinking saving them one sixth of the CD is worth some effort. So can I replace some of these FSF packages with BusyBox, replace glibc with uclibc, and try to get that footprint down? The answer was no. Um, when I actually tried to use BusyBox as part of a development environment capable of rebuilding itself under itself, a real deployable system, it had missing commands, missing options to commands, it would seg fault, it would hang, the code was crap. So I, I fixed it. I learned sed by writing a sed implementation. I rewrote sort from scratch. And I became maintainer sort of by accident because I was doing more work than Eric Anderson was. Eric uh, inherited BusyBox from him. And so he handed over maintainership to me. But my goal was uh, cr you know, creating the simplest system that I could that could rebuild itself under itself. I eventually got it down to seven packages. You know, replacing the whole, um, BusyBox was replacing something like 28 of the original Linux from scratch packages. And then I switched from BusyBox to ToyBox for reasons that, I, I, I started over because I reached the point where, you know, I, I need to do a clean implementation to fix some architectural issues. But, one of the other things that happened is I got into cross-compiling. When QEMU became usable in about 2005, I went, well, I don't just want to create this system for x86 and x86-64. Let me cross-compile it for ARM and then have a native compiler working on ARM that I don't need to cross-compile anything anymore once I can native compile under emulation. And you can actually use distcc to call out to the cross-compiler to get some of the speed back. QEMU does not emulate usable SMP. It, it doesn't use multiple processors on the host when it's emulating SMP. And these days everybody has SMP systems. But if you use distcc to call out to the cross-compiler, that can use SMP on the host. And it's still, it's still using the it's still natively pre-processing the files inside the emulator, and it's still linking inside the emulator. So there's only one set of headers. There's only one set of libraries. When you run your configure stage, it can execute all the binaries that it, that it creates to run its tests. So it still acts like a completely native compile. And the fact that DCC is using a cross-compiler instead of a native compiler is a, is a detail you don't have to care about. So I was trying to get as many targets working as possible under QEMU so that package maintainers, you know, if, if you get a bug report that says this breaks on MIPS and you go, I don't have a MIPS system, I can go, well, here's a tarball, extract that tarball, CD into it, run the shell script that's in there, it will launch QEMU and give you a shell prompt, W get the source code, compile it in there, run your test, and that'll demonstrate the bug, and then you can test your own fixes. You know, that seemed useful to do, so I was trying to get as many targets as possible to work, and QEMU had an SH4 implementation. And I went, okay, I'll try to get this to work. And I deeply confused a man named Paul Munt, who <laughs> couldn't quite understand why someone who wasn't a Renesis customer was interested in SH4. But that was one of the ones that I fought my way through. I had to fix problems in QEMU. I had to fix problems in the tool chain. I had to fix problems in the kernel because a lot of stuff had bit rotted. But it had worked at one point and I made it work again. And I was sort of maintaining my own support for it and pushing patches upstream where I could to make sure that it stayed running along with the other platforms I got running. And then Jeff tracked me down because my Aboriginal Linux project supported SH4, and I was one of the people still publicly advocating for, I would like this to work. The Super H architecture became interesting again as the patents expired, and it was possible to do a royalty-free implementation that could be posted under a BSC license and can make a two and a half cent chip. The reason we can make a two and a half cent chip here is we're not paying any royalties. And you won't have to either. We're not charging any royalties. You know, 
it's it's open. Thank you. Good luck. So I think I keep our minds up. Oh, okay. So I think I think the the answer is that we'd like to of course work with work with you to make sure that support for all of the, the the devices that you're producing are also there. So we are going to maintain it, as Rob has said. Uh, we have to for our own purpose. And the benefit of that should accrue to Renesis as well. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any reason why we would why we would do anything but co collaborate with each other to get that to happen. So so what happened was like maybe a few days ago, uh, we called like the Nagayama-san of the, the, uh, like Renesis. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, ask ask uh, ask her to just actually hand over the LLVM code mm -hmm. that you know like that uh, Renesis kind of abandoned like maybe in 2012 or something, mm -hmm. and so that we can actually do that um, mm -hmm. like clan LLVM. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I mentioned that the existing tools with SH2 support are old, mm -hmm. and this old support has been brought forward into the new tools. They, they didn't remove it. They, they've only been doing compile regression testing. There's things like build root claims to have SH2 support, but it doesn't have an SH2 elf to flag or FDPIC support. So it tries to build elf binaries in an SH2 root file system, and you can't run those on a no even new system. So it's like, Okay, there's there's some missing pieces. They only tested that it compiled. They didn't test that it made sense. Um, so we're we're fixing that in the old tools, but the UC libc project is moribund. It it it's essentially dead, but still useful. Uh, it hasn't had a release since 2012, and if it did have any release at this point, I don't think anyone would care. The new project we want to go to is muscle libc. Well, similarly, GCC development switched to GPLv3 and kind of went off a cliff. And it's still going forward, but it's going forward in a direction that's less and less interesting to a lot of people. And the people who are losing interest in, in GCC are coalescing behind LLVM. And we would very much like to use LLVM as our processor. We were actually looking at, you know, do we have to get a contractor to write SH2 support and then later do SH4 support. SH3 was, the SH3 instruction set was only really shipping for about a year. So, you know, although we could do SH3, it's going straight from SH2 to full, full MMU in the new instruction set, you know. Those are kind of the two modes that interest us. But, and then, but then we found that there was a Renesis uh, LLVM port that just was never released outside of the company because Renesis changed strategic direction to new processors. And it exists, the code is written, the code works. If we could get that, it would save us hiring a consultant and you know wasting six months of time. It, it's not just... It's not just the LLVM thing that was abandoned. Um, Elf to flat, for example. We have the problem that because uclinux.org rolled to a stop a decade ago, there was no longer a place collecting the various changes people made. So the cold fire support for Elf to flat is integrated in the old version that uclibc.org has. The Blackfin support is in a fork that's on Mike Freisinger's personal website that never went upstream to anywhere. The SH2 support is in a version code sorcery released okay. back around 2012 before they were acquired by Mentor Graphics. And when they were acquired by Mentor Graphics, the people who did that left. And they stopped supporting Super H at all. So it's a different abandoned fork, and because BuildRoot is using Mike Freisinger's fork, oh, one of the things that happened to uclinux.org is their CVS archive had a hard drive failure, and there was no backup. And because it's CVS, it wasn't distributed, meaning their historical repositories are gone. All there is is tarball snapshots and things. So BuildRoot, because there was no repository, they rebased on the Mike Freisinger Blackfin port. 
we looked at merging the SH2 ELF to flat thing, which had all the code source rechanges. It was not on top of a vanilla upstream version. It was on top of all the other changes code source Rea had made, most of which, strangely, are for ARM. So there's you know over 10,000 lines of changes, of which we're probably interested in maybe 200, but I could never figure out which 200 they were. So there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to put all this stuff back together. What I'm actually thinking of doing is not trying to fix ELF to flat so much, I'm looking at FDPIC because at least that support went upstream, but how to use it is completely undocumented. And I'm actually reading code to try to reverse engineer how to use that code. And then I write documentation so nobody else has to do that because that's hard. Okay, so there's a lot of this stuff where we are salvaging work that people previously did, but because that work didn't go back upstream, it wasn't maintained and it's fallen off the net. And it's very difficult to pick this stuff back up and, and clean it up and put it together. So we're doing that so that it stays. Mm -hmm. And then also like uh, Mark Mitchell, you know, like, uh, like when I started at the ZeroPF, I think that the first thing I did was like call, call him up. And uh, he was saying that, okay, like you, we have to get some kind of backing from either Japanese government or like some large company. And then maybe if that happens, that I can help you, is what he was saying. So, mm -hmm. Like maybe, so, so maybe to some degree, like that, uh, that the, we know, always like that they say support, but the problem was cross tools. Mm -hmm. I mean, that the uh, runtime, some piece, some smart people like you guys can do it, but uh, like but the cross tool was like so esoteric that it was just very difficult. I mentioned in my Aboriginal Linux pro project, its motto is we cross compile so you don't have to. I hate cross compiling. It really, really sucks. I do it sort of the reason that people plunge toilets. It's like I'm making a clean environment so you don't have to care what I went through to get you the clean environment. We are dealing with um, a, a lot of the issues like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, what, one other thing. To, to <laughs> um, one of the issues we're having right now is there are a lot of people with existing NoMMU knowledge and existing knowledge of these old platforms who learned it back in the 90s. But it's all interpersonal relationships. The only reason I've learned half of what I know about NoMMU is because my boss did it. Mm -hmm. And I can ask Jeff questions. Mm -hmm. That doesn't scale. So we're fixing all that. We're actually, these websites are so you don't have to ask us personally. All right, so um, uh, thanks very much. Um, we went over time. I, I, I apologize for that, but uh, I hope it was interesting, uh, at least for some yes. people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.